In trying to assess the wider implications of Sunday's loss, I came up with three words, all of them starting with the letter D. Obviously, demoralizing would have been among them, deflating for sure, but I worry that this loss was damaging for Aston Villa, not just on the day, but of course, losing John McGinn for three Premier League games. And I put it down to one major issue and two mega moments that define this match as we forensically review Villa nil, Spurs 4. When I saw that Sunday was the fifth anniversary of Jack Grealish being mugged at St. Andrews and then going on to score the game winner in what was the greatest day of his life, I thought to myself, well, that's a good omen. And then I reflected gratefully on what has transpired in those five short years, although it feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? I mean, if somebody had said to us on that day, hey, in five years, you're going to be in fourth in the Premier League, we would have laughed in your face. Sadly, it wasn't a good omen in the end. Unai Emery's first loss to Tottenham and heaviest home defeat since becoming a Premier League manager did come at a rather inopportune time with 10 matches left in the season. It's not just that our grip on fourth may be slipping. If we're not careful, we've opened the door now for Manchester United eight points back with fifth place possibly still being a Champions League spot next season. And given the financial situation that the club just reported, not getting into Champions League now could have implications, both short and longer term. I've held off commenting about the profit and sustainability stuff because I don't profess to know all the ins and outs of how it works, but 120 million is significant in terms of losses, considering we have added a lot of high-end technical staff to the footballing side and even commercial and business staff on top of the rise in players' wages. And the way the Sky 6 Cabal operates, you are rewarded if you have a big stadium because you can generate more revenue, buy more players, and just be more competitive. Unless, of course, you're Manchester City, in which case you just invent make-believe numbers and then have your legal team grind the investigation to a halt and delay the inevitable punishment that you're going to get. If this club was unaware of the impending losses coming this year, then I would be extremely worried. But I simply cannot believe that they weren't aware of the real-time balance sheet issues we would be facing. And if one of the plans that they have short and medium term is Champions League football to mitigate some of those losses, well then, whoa, the pressure is really on over these final 10 games. And here's where, hindsight is 2020, but taking the low-hanging fruit of a betting sponsor for the front of your jersey, which can't even be worn in most European countries, might be a little short-sighted. And most jersey sponsors have bonuses built in for being able to appear on one of the biggest stages in the world. Again, it's easy to say that all in hindsight. And here's the other thing. Even if we do qualify for Champions League, but we have some restraint on our spending, how on earth are we supposed to navigate those competitions Exhibit A, Newcastle United this year. Welcome inside the parlor and the Holy Trinity show where we attempt to break things right down, separate fantasy from reality, and the reality on Sunday felt very, very bleak. Just like the day, a nice, liquid, sunshiny day in B6, and Samir was there rolling the camera. He, too, was feeling very glum after the game. Normally, Samir's a really positive guy, and he did capture some wonderful moments. But there were some truths and realities to this game that I think have a lot of Villa fans a tiny bit spooked. As far as the key numbers are concerned, while the attacking stats between this game and Ajax in combination officially fall in the utterly grim category, and we had the ball intercepted 18 times. That's significant to me. Either the passes weren't good, 
or Spurs were reading them quickly like a book, which kind of tells its own little story. We need to start with the team selection, and I'm not having that this was the cause of today's problems because we did well in the first 50 minutes to contain Spurs from transitioning and breaking away. In fact, their first half XG was 0.03. They had not a sniff. And when you look at this 11, the only real change surrounded Jacob Ramsey and his pain threshold. Had he started, it would have looked like many other recent games. Bailey on the right, Konza at right back. Some called this a five at the back. It still looked like four to me with Dean at times playing higher and Cash playing in right midfield. But you start putting square pegs into round holes. You have Cash playing wide right, Bailey wide left, Konza as right back. This is what might happen. If Jacob Ramsey was fit and available, you have to think that one of Cash, Longley, or Konza would have made way. Not helping matters on Sunday was the fact that Matt Cash had a dreadful outing. I mean, he could barely keep his feet inside the first 15 minutes. I counted three times that he slipped and fell over. Was that a footwear issue? But he only completed 77% of his passes. He was dribbled past three times, only won half of his duels, and he simply could not find a teammate with any of his crossing opportunities. And like many of his teammates in Claret, he looked labored in decision-making. Now, if I'm Big Ange and I look at the team sheet, I'm telling my players, go after Konza and Cash hard because they're slightly out of position. And Udogi, Johnson, and Basuma all obliged with good effect. Big moment, which I thought was going to be a turning point, and oddly enough, it turned into one, even though it didn't turn the way I thought it would, and that was Mickey Van de Ven's withdrawal early in the second half. This guy is a stud. 22 years of age, six foot three, great in the air and on the ground, good feet, fast. He's got a little bit of bite to him as well. He snuffed out that Ollie Watkins chance very early, cleaned him out, closed him down, left some afters, and I think Watkins didn't fancy it and switched sides to try to work on Romero instead. And so when he was withdrawn, I thought, well, this is our opportunity to get in and maybe test another relatively unproven 22-year-old, Dragosen. Samir caught this really nice moment, a very dedicated Emmy Martinez fan with this beautiful custom scarf. I really wished he could have given it to Martinez after the game, but I think he was probably, like many others, either gone or very grumpy. Samir definitely missed out on trading one of his Henson specials for that beautiful custom scarf. Big issue number three, lethargic legs. I wondered during my last show, the Ajax review, whether Spurs not playing midweek European games might benefit them physically and mentally, or whether Aston Villa's volume of work might put them into a groove or a rhythm coming into this match. Well, Villa had to play a very aggressive, young and energetic Ajax team on Thursday, add in some travel, and you could definitely see evidence of lethargy sinking in. Some of them might be, you know, not winning a foot race even when you have a step, being caught offside because you're just not mentally with it, deferring and not shooting when you normally do shoot, being closed down so quickly you don't get your shot off, no pop in your shot, no pop in your passing. All of these things were appearing during Sunday's game. And here's where the accumulation of all these injuries are now coming back to haunt us. And again, it's a no excuse culture. The next man up needs to be ready. That's the way it is. But you can't tell me that a fit Buendia wouldn't have offered spark in so many circumstances or options for rest for somebody else. Same goes for Ramsey. Bubakar Kamara is a nailed on starter. And even Tyrone Mings, if fit, gives you options in the cup competitions without necessarily lowering your standards. We now have four guys on 270 minutes this week. Watkins, Longley, Martinez, and Louise. And I'm very concerned about what our striking options are if Watkins needs a rest or, heaven forbid, worse. If Zaniolo's the next man up, we're in trouble. And I think John Duran is neither ready and he's too erratic. 
even on a small sample size, I feel like our best option right now is Morgan Rogers if he absolutely had to play in that position. And Watkins, like at Luton, was given a right kicking on Sunday, and I don't blame the opposition for that rather obvious but sensible ploy. Be physical with him, be relentless with him, and he may back off. Well, I said it earlier, Van de Ven, early parts of the game, closes him down in a second, gives him some afters, and after that, Watkins didn't fancy it anymore. More, and you know Romero's not going to turn aside the chance for whacking somebody. And I know Aston Villa is a no-excuse club, but my concern is with Watkins and others, there was evidence in this game of physical fatigue and being mentally shattered as well. Big moment number two. Villa blinked first. I really enjoyed that first half. It flew by, despite there not being a raft of huge chances at either end or a back-and-forth type game like the first one was between these two teams. Extremely tactical. There was an edge to it. And you and I both knew that this game was going to come down to one of two things. An error or a moment of magic. And if it was an error, could the team that benefited from that error be ruthless and punishing in the penalty area. We have similarities with Tottenham Hotspur. We both play a high line that forces compression and quick thinking in the middle of the park. And we also like to front press at times, turn the ball over and ideally counter and score like the 4-2 goal against Forrest is a great example. Big Ange's identity for this team is all about hard pressing, winning the ball, and then exploiting those wide areas. It has been their bread and butter all season. At halftime, and even into the first moments of the second half, I was still pretty confident that one of those chances and moments might fall our way. We didn't let Spurs do what they wanted and transition and break, and we were putting them under pressure and occasionally winning the ball back. But then came the 50th minute, five minutes into the second half. And as you know, the first five minutes and last five minutes of a half are really important times that you need to manage carefully because so often goals during those times are tone and momentum changers. And Unai Emery called this a mistake. We chased after the ball in not the best area overcommitted men and then left ourselves exposed in our defensive third. This goal reminded me so much of the one we conceded to Palace earlier this season, similar time in the game earlier in the second half where we tried to commit, got played around, and in this case it was four players, Dean, Longley, Tielemans, and Pau Torres, played through so easily. I mean, you do have to give some credit to the protagonists in white for being sharp-footed and sharp-minded here, but is that another example of mental and physical fatigue in this circumstance? Now, from here on, We've struggled mightily in these situations of late. This is how we got done in against Manchester United. We were 2v1 in the box, and neither Cash nor Konza really marked Madison at all. And credit to Pape Sar, a player we were linked with a couple of summers ago, remember? What a ball he fizzes in here. Emmy Martinez doesn't know if he should go for it or not. Some might say, well, fly out with your fists, Emmy. You might put Madison off. But that's splitting hairs at this stage because it was a splitting ball that we simply couldn't deal with. What's concerning to me is how labored Pau Torres looks coming back. I mean, first of all, he's played around so easily here and he is not making any great concerted effort to get back into his penalty area. He's so far behind the play. And you might have noticed he has tape strapping on his quad, which is interesting. That means for sure he is not 100% fit. And the risk reward of losing him for longer spells down the stretch here is quite worrying to me, even though Diego Carlos is back. We've only lost three times with Pau Torres in our lineup, but I think those three times he was fully fit. And then just three minutes later, Ezri Konza plays a horror ball to Yuri Tielemans, putting him in a terrible predicament. And before you know it, we've been sucker punched and knockout punched 
within 270 seconds of one another. Now, there is a notion that Yuri Tielemans could slide into central midfield and play alongside Douglas Louise and John McGinn's absence, but it's in these kinds of circumstances where I get nervous about that idea. I know it'll be discussed, but Yuri Tielemans physically has a tendency to get bossed around in these areas of the park. Paul Hansaker of 24-7 Services was at the match with his eldest daughter, Lily, who turned her friend into a Villa fan, Agent Lily, on the case. And they were schmoozing with Alan McAnally, who had the crowd there all whipped up. Tony Daly was there making an appearance. And then afterwards, Paul was ambushed by a bunch of big, burly Norwegian lions who paddled to the game game through the fjords via a viking vessel which is amazing love me some norwegian lions viewers of this show yarla espen anders and sigurd thank you so much for watching you guys i'm a little surprised that the aston social has those drop down ceilings not very cozy is it and 24 7 services can deal with that rip it all out paint everything and expose it all in black to give it that kind of intimate feel any project you could think of at home in the office at your recreational property starts with a fair quote and you can get the numbers or a contact form at 24 7's new website and on that note i am so excited to share that my sandra and i are coming back to birmingham for a three-game week Wolves at home, Man City away, and Brentford at home. Lots of work commitments through 24-7 services. Can't wait to meet the staff and some of their clients. So I will be sharing some meetup potential places and locations prior to the Wolves game and the Brentford game. After Brentford, I will most likely be at the Aston Social, but watch my socials and I'll share that with you. And I really have to thank both Tony Gibson and Chris Woods for inviting us back into their Trinity suite again because it's hard to get tickets and the process is incredible. Plus, it's a working trip, and it's easier to work in the suites. So, Gibbo and Woodsy, from the bottom of our hearts, can't wait to see you, and thank you so much. Oh, and by the way, one of my old friends and work colleagues and a huge Villa fan, Dale West, is going to lose his Villa Park virginity at the Wolves game with his wife, Allison. Another thing for me to look forward to. And by the way, now we know the lay of the land. We know our way around. We know the great places to eat. So, this is going to be an epic visit, and I cannot wait to see you. And the number one big moment that defined Villa nil Spurs 4, Captain Castigated. I've been saying often this season how when the summer comes around and the dust of the season has settled, we may have to look back on certain moments, like, for example, a late Luca Dean winner at Luton. And unfortunately, and I'm concerned that we might have to look back on this moment as potentially the one that derailed our Champions League quest. And the fact that I now know that McGinn will be missing for two of the three games I'm coming over for, selfishly, a big kick to the down belows. Now, we have to look at this from several different viewpoints, starting with the decision itself. Opinions seemed actually quite evenly split on this decision. In fact, I think more people were leaning the way I did initially and after having seen it again to red card, with some saying the reaction of the Spurs bench may have influenced Chris Kavanaugh's decision. Credit to him, though. He didn't brandish the express red card right away. He thought about it. Tough game, and I thought he did a reasonably good job, but the minute the referee does brandish the red, it's up to VAR to find a clear and obvious error, which they did not. And for the conspiracy theorists among us, well, here was the perfect opportunity to lend Tottenham Hotspur and Manchester United a helping hand in ensuring that unfashionable little old Aston Villa would not be smirch the coveted Champions League places. But perhaps the bigger question is why? Why did John McGinn choose that moment to go and take a very healthy-sized chunk out of Udogi right in front of the Spurs dugout, the referee, the fourth official, the assistant referee? And you know what? Samir said to me after the game, and I fully agree with him. I think McGinn was really frustrated with the circumstances and the fact that it seemed like he was the only one who had the heart to go and do something about it. Keeping in mind, he didn't play the majority of the Ajax game, so he might have been fresher than some of his teammates. And just prior to the incident, he had whipped the crowd up already. Maybe he was just trying to whip them up a little bit more 
to help give his teammates a much needed adrenaline boost. Instead, John McGinn's first Aston Villa red card just made a tall order even taller. And I knew, like many, at that point, the game was over. And yet, with plenty of time still, we had to at least give the impression that we were trying to chase the game, even though what I saw was a leggy and shattered looking group. It was the worst possible scenario. Then you come to the realization you're going to miss John McGinn for three key Premier League games, two of which I would say are winnable. And John McGinn said himself, this was the most important game in Aston Villa's recent history. What must have been going through his mind as he made the long, lonely walk down the tunnel and into an empty dressing room? Small consolation, but you know that John McGinn will be extra motivated to lead his team to the Europa Conference League quarterfinals with a win on Thursday at home against Ajax. But I look at this squad right now and I go, where are the goals coming from? Because starting Ollie Watkins might truly be a risk. And is John Duran ready fitness-wise? Is his head right? And then you have to think about this. John McGinn missing for the next three Premier League outings. Does that change? how we're going to approach these certain competitions in the last couple of months of the season. Seriously, I know this club wants to win a trophy, but at what cost? Because winning the Europa Conference League comes with it, something that we basically already have locked up right now, a spot in the Europa League. And the Europa League doesn't pay the bills. We know a couple of things for sure heading into this week. John McGinn will start against Ajax on Thursday and Ezri Konza will not. We also know there's a game coming up at West Ham on Sunday that falls, I think, into the winnable category. And they didn't play the greatest on Sunday themselves. After that, though... It's all up in the air, and these are huge moments for our manager, Unai Emery. This is the biggest pressure-packed moment of his tenure so far and why he gets paid the big bucks, which helped contribute to some of the losses this last year. And so I'm going to be very curious to see which lineup he does put out on Thursday and whether that'll tell us some things about how Aston Villa is going to approach the run-in. Our third home league loss this season was crushing, and that was the first time we were blanked at home since Chelsea under Gerrard in October of 22. Our second half plus minus took a beating, and I know goals three and four were probably meaningless in the game, but there will be implications because we've now lost our goal difference edge with Spurs. This was a big moment in our season. West Ham looked kind of like we did against bottom side Burnley on Sunday, but they still came back to earn a point. And that game in London before an international break is looming large, and we've not been great at the Olympic Stadium. I know, all losses suck. And I won't remember this game for the scoreline. I'll remember it for the missed opportunity. Think about the alternative. Eight points up on Spurs and with John McGinn still available. We've gone from being the hunters throughout the course of this season to now the hunted. How will that change our mentality? And I'm not trying to belabor the point or be alarmist or overdramatic, but the decisions we make from here on in for the run-in of the season could go a long way in determining the progression of this football club, both short, medium, and long-term. Until Ajax, lick your wounds, and as always, up the mighty villa.